I'll just wait um, for a few more to join and then we'll get started. Okay, so our morphology webinar today is all about um, how we can use it with uh, teaching morphology to enhance spelling. And also I touch on how we use morphology in our new spelling shed scheme, which will be out in September. There is a preview of the year six uh, new spelling shed scheme on the website. And at the end, I'll show you where you can find that so that you can have a bit of a look at it. It's all free. So if you've got a spelling shed subscription already, you'll automatically get the new scheme when it's out in September. So I should also mention that this presentation has been made by my colleague Rob Smith, who is the creator of Literacy Shed, which lots of you might have heard of before. So he's done a lot of research that's within this PowerPoint. So I'm hoping that I do it justice. If you have any questions as we go, you can pop them in the chat or in the Q&A box at the top and I'll just make sure that I keep an eye on it and maybe answer them at the end. This presentation will probably last about 20 minutes and then I'm gonna go through very quickly some of the online stuff in the Teacher Hub at the end, which will probably take an extra five. You'll be able to find the recording on our EdShed YouTube channel and I'll also email it out afterwards. Okay, and then Rob was also saying when he created this PowerPoint that he relates a lot to cats within it. So there is a small disclaimer. Sorry if you're not a fan of cats. So we'll start with how many words there are in the English language. So there are 171,146 words in the Oxford Dictionary. And these range from A to Zizivar which is a very small sort of weevil-like creature. I'd never heard of that one before. And within those words, we have an average working vocabulary of around 20,000 words. And this active vocabulary is what each person uses sort of generally day to day. We also have something called a passive vocabulary of about 40,000 words. And these are words that we understand, but do not confidently use ourselves just yet. Then we've got our high frequency words, which of course we will know um, from teaching to um, the younger children and having to do certain in each year group. Um, I'm sorry, I was just having a look at someone saying the sound isn't working. Um, you're welcome to leave the webinar and try and join it again. Otherwise, I will send around the recording, as I mentioned, at the end, um, if it's still not working for you. I've just checked mine and I've done a test, so I'm sure, so I think mine is working. Um, now, the high frequency words come from something called the Oxford English Corpus, which is a text corpus of 21st century English, and it's used by the makers of the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and what they do in this research programme is they take all sorts of texts that might be published, recently published books, reports, journals, magazines, newspapers, blogs, all sorts, lectures, I think even. And what they do is from that, sort of scan them all and have a look at all of them and come up with the high frequency words that are used most commonly throughout all of those different text types as sort of example. And that's where these come from. And that's also, I've learned, where um, words come from that are then added within the Oxford English Dictionary. So if the word sort of emoji has been added, if a new word constantly comes up a certain amount of times, that's when they then decide to add it into the English Dictionary. Now, the 100 most frequently used words are 50% of all uh, in 50% of everything that we read and write. And the 300 most frequently used words are in 65% of all that we read and write. So that's why it's so crucial that we teach maybe not 300 of them, but a lot of them very early on as they pop up in so many books and everything. Children need to be able to use them to string sentences together. Um, <laughs> There we go. So if we look at the word morphology itself and almost look at the etymology of the word, so we've got morph that means form 
and ology, which is the study of. So morphology is essentially then the study of the formation of words. So the English lexicon is huge and we can teach students many words and we can encourage them to read and expand their vocabulary in that way too. However, we can help this expansion by explaining how words are made by combining words or adding affixes. So affixes, I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. Affixes are a couple of letters which are added either at the beginning or the end of a word. So prefixes and suffixes are affixes. So the root word here is morph and then the affix in this case um, is a suffix, which is ology. So that is almost the etymology of the word morphology. Now, morphemes are the smallest word parts to carry meaning. So if we have the word cats, for instance, it's made up of the base word, or some might call it a root word, cat, and then our suffix, which makes it plural, which is the S here to make the word cats. Now, you can explain this to children quite unfairly early on as they sort of start to learn plurals for things and how we can chunk words up in this way. Of course, pupils from the early years will have chunked words into their GPCs, for example. So they'll be used to chunking up words into their sounds for cat to be cat and then s. But we can introduce this way quite early on as well to show that how we can add um, different letters to change the meaning of a word. Now, the key terms Key terms um, in here, I mentioned the base word and root word. Now they are different and um, it's quite easy to tell the difference. So a base word is a word that can stand alone when all of the affixes have been removed. And the root carries the primary meaning of the word, but a root does not always stand alone as an English word when the affixes have been removed. And this can be when part of a word um, has derived from, say, a Latin word or French word, for example. So here, the base word is help because help makes sense and is in our language and we use the word help on its own. Whereas here, the word mort, such as mortal, mortgage, immortal, is a root word, but not a base word, as we don't use the word mort on its own in our English language. So confusingly, a word can be a base word and a root word, but some words are root words and not base words. So if they make sense in their own, they're base words, that's an easy way to think of the difference. And then affixes are a group of letters that can be added to the beginning or end of a word or root word. So types of affix is prefix, which are the group of letters added to the beginning of a root word to change the meaning of it. And a suffix, the same, which we add to the end to change the meaning of it. Now, there's also something here called a derivative which is sort of just a fact for teachers rather than explaining this, children probably don't need to know this one. So it's a word which is formed by adding suffixes and prefixes to a root or combining two base words to form a compound word. So it's more of a teacher term uh, rather than needing to be introduced to pupils, but just an extra fact there for you. Now here is a suggested teaching sequence that from Rob's research he has found. So it's not set in stone, but many start with teaching some basic high frequency words, as we discussed earlier, they're so important because they come up in about 50% of everything that we read and write. Then going on to compound words, then prefixes, suffixes and root words, which all kind of interlink there. And then this can be spiralised throughout the primary sector. So sections are then revisited as words get more difficult and vocabulary is expanded as children go up the school. So it's just sort of a nice example teaching sequence that um, might be good to follow. And then we go on to compound words. Now, compound words are words which have their own meaning, but have then been put together to make another word which has got its own individual meaning. 
And what's really great about compound words is if you know and understand part of the word, you can then understand quite quickly the whole word. So for example, if we think about the word football, we've got the word foot and ball, which say we know already. And then we've got football, which is a ball kicked with the foot. And same with the hairbrush, a brush for combing the hair. So quite easily, we can section up words like this, which not only helps spelling and vocabulary, and it also can help us widen um, the meaning and definition of the word so that children can then put it into context and use it within sentences and within their work. Now, with our new scheme, we've used investigations such as this. This one's taken from one of our year one lessons where children can work in pairs to split the compound words. And you can see it's been done here. Um, and just starting to look at words slightly differently and how we can chunk them up almost in order to learn them and make learning their spelling that little bit easier. And then the words become more difficult further up, the compound words, which we can see here, but the concept always stays the same. So if we can spell the components, then it will make spelling the words simpler. So even though they look much more complicated, they're not at all. And just makes it into more manageable chunks. So here we've got um, some prefixes. So according to some sources, nine prefixes account for 75% of words that use a prefix and 20 prefixes account for 97% of the words which use prefixes. So if we choose carefully which prefixes that we explicitly teach, it then opens the door to a whole load more words that children can spell and use in their vocabulary. So the four in green here are the most frequent and also teaching the meaning of the prefix and how that changes the meaning of the words and just starting to look at those different patterns, which we can see. Now, 97% of all words use these 20 prefixes, which we can see here. Um, so it increases vocabulary, making the spelling of words simpler. And it allows children to learn that a chunk of work for the root is spelled. So here, for example, if we've got the word disappear, lots of people or children decide um, or have the question, does it have a cap uh, double S, sorry, or a double P? If you had explicitly taught the prefixes really clearly then they know that there's no way that this word could have a double s anyway because it's got the prefix dis which is always going to be spelt d-i-s and the same with the prefix un it's always un and never u-n-n -N. so it helps spelling within that sense and the understanding of the formation of the word. Now, here's something else that we use within our scheme, word webs. So lots of different ways of recording words which have that prefix or suffix. We also have word ladders and things like silly sentences. So then using some of these in silly sentences to write. Also things like finding a non-example. So these are all when un is a prefix. Whereas if we use the words underneath, un isn't a prefix in that word, although the first two letters are U and N, it doesn't work in the same way. And we can't break up the word into those chunks or morphemes in that way. So also getting children to find non-examples as well really helps them show their understanding with prefixes or suffixes, whichever you're looking at, um, at why something is wrong and why it would be wrong. And then here are some more um, just snapshots from our scheme, really. So once we've explored the spelling of the words, children then practice them in context. And you can see here we've got filling in sort of the gaps in the sentences, which shows that they must know the meaning of the word because they have to use it within a sentence. 
And then here we've got one of our really lovely word shed slides, which you can easily differentiate depending on what you put in each box. I'll show a simpler version in a moment. Um, so we've got the root word using the word in the middle within a sentence, the um, synonyms for that particular word. And then here's a slightly more simplified version. You could add a prefix, add a suffix, add a prefix and suffix, or also use your new words in a sentence. So really looking at the different root words and how we can change the meanings, depending on what the prefix and suffix are that we have added. And that's just an example there. The final example I've got is this one. So we've got our root word in red there and then the different um, prefixes and suffixes which we can add on. You could make this more simple by taking away the two left hand bottom boxes there um, and just having the three simple boxes at the top and seeing how many different words they can make, which prefixes and suffixes go with this root word to create a new word with a new meaning. Can they make words which are nonsense words, which aren't um, in our English language or how the longest word they could make, sort of like unquestionable, for example, and have a look at just how many different words they can make and deciding whether they're a real word or not. So you could simplify that easily or maybe even putting it into a sentence. Um, lots of different ways that you can use something like this as a bit of an investigation or group activity. And then um, as with prefixes, as we discussed learning particular ones, which can then open the doors to a whole load more vocabulary and words, it's very similar with suffixes. So the top seven here, these suffixes, make up 82% of all words that have suffixes. So if you teach these seven, you'll then very quickly be able to open the door to a whole load new vocabulary that the children um, will then be able to know rather than looking at lots and lots of different types of suffixes. And that will then help spellings like these, which we see quite often. So she had hoped, but we've got she hopped for a new bike for Christmas. The bunny hopped along the path. She happily set to her grandmother's house. If we had more knowledge of the different suffixes and how they're added and how the spelling changes when they're added, then that would then prevent these types of spellings here. And one of the ways we can do this is by looking at things like this. I've got it in a really lovely flow diagram on the next slide. So for solutions for adding er, ing, est, ed and y, if you had a printout of this or had it on display, you can then easily use this um, to decide what there should be. So does the word end in two consonants? If we think about the word jump, for example, um, if it's yes, we just add the suffix. So we just add ed for jumped or jumping or jumper. Does the word end with a short vowel sound followed by a consonant. So if we think about the word hug, for example, we then need to double the consonant and add the suffix. So for hugged, we then have a double G um, or hugging or hugger, for example. And then for three, does the word end in a consonant followed by E? So if we think about the word comfortable, we then take off the E and add the suffix. So if it was comfortably, for example. And then finally, does the word end in a consonant and a Y? So if it was something like happy, we then change the Y to an I um, and add the suffix. So then L-Y for happily. And it goes through all of these um, different ways that we can use. Now, the thing here that you would need to explicitly teach is how not all the suffixes can be added to a word for it to then make sense or create a new word. And here is the really lovely flow diagram that shows this. This would be really nice to have as a display or have children have words on post-it notes and physically move them down through the flow diagram, the flow chart. So if we've got some examples here, so bad, does the word end in a Y or LE? No, so then we add 
the ly for badly. And this is just to change adjectives into adverbs with the suffix flow diagram for ly. And then if we've got angry, for example, does it end in a y? Yes. So then we replace the y with an i and add the ly for angrily. And terrible would go here and it would be the ly for terribly. So that's a really nice way that you could get the children to then move the words around and come up with words that fit in these three different categories. And learning these types of things will help eliminate those um, spellings that we get all the time, which children find quite tricky. Now, all of this um, that we talked about today is really great as long as it adds value. So ways it might not add value and almost make it more confusing, if you then try and find, say to children, trying to find little words inside big words, rather than specifically looking at affixes. So for example, looking for words like hen in then and eat in weather doesn't help you learn how to spell those words or give you sort of any extra meaning or learning to do with those words. If anything, it adds a layer to making it more confusing. So only using morphemes accurately and where they help the spelling process. There's no point in doing it if it doesn't add value. So as another um, cat themed slide, home, the word homeowner may have the word meow in it but it has nothing to do with possessing a house um, and anything to do with cats. If anything, it makes it slightly more confusing, I think, looking at the word meow and the word homeowner rather than spitting it up into home and owner as one of those compound words that we discussed earlier. So in summary, so we have a large vocabulary, but we only use part of it any one time. Children cannot be expected to be able to remember how to spell all words by memory alone, which is why teaching things such as morphology knowledge alongside high frequency words, orthographical mapping and etymology will help the spelling process. And that's all started when children start to learn phonics and splitting words up into their GPCs. So just constantly looking at how we can split them up, whether it's a prefix and it changes the meaning of the word, for example, and making sure that we use morphology accurately and introduce it very gradually and using diagrams to aid recall of the guidelines, such as the colourful ones that I showed before. Um, I will, at the end of this, send out the recording, but also this PowerPoint too. So you can use those slides if you would like to, if that makes it helpful to show your class um, with adding suffixes. And what I will do now is show you the teacher hub and what that looks like very quickly if you haven't seen Spelling Shed or anything like that before. Okay, so we exit that. Here is the um, one of the lessons, lesson plans, which you can use as you want to. So you've got this week's words there. Um, and they all follow the same structure. And it just also means that if you've got different teaching staff, teaching spelling groups, whether you split them up, however you do it, it just means you've got a really detailed lesson plan that and it's really easy to follow. And then going back to, I'll just show you in resources where I found our new scheme. So here they are, and then at the bottom there, the 2022 preview with stage six. And all these green ones, which are free, you can access with a trial. So that was the lesson plan that we looked at. We've then got the worksheets, some of which I showed on the presentation, and then you've got the teaching PowerPoint if you want to have a look at that there. So they're all there for you to have a good look at. Um, you can also do things if you've not used Spelling Shed before, you can assign words to pupils and the words go alongside the teaching PowerPoints. So if you taught the lesson plan that I just briefly showed here, then the lesson one stage six will be the same as those words. And you can assign those words for the pupils to access on their login and any spelling game that they play will be that list of words. So I've got all of the different um, 
subscriptions here. You can also make your own list of words for people to practice, whether that goes with a topic or just a certain select number of people that need something that's very personalized to them. You can do that very easily on our word lists. You can also, for the younger children, have word lists which are phonics based and go alongside phonics. And it also means that when they play the game, the uh, GPCs are separated and read out as sounds rather than letter names. You can also do something called a hive game, which is where all the different, all children have a device. You create a hive and it can be used to replace a spelling test. So if you choose a list that you say want to test and it can be in place of a traditional spelling test um, and then you create it. Okay. They input this code into their device and then all of their iPads become an answering uh, board almost. So the word will get read out from the teacher's computer and then each child will input their spelling and then you'll get a really nice report of what all the different children um, spelled and if they spelled any incorrectly what that was or whether they just missed it and you can print these out um, and there's just a lot uh, more engaging way really of doing your traditional spelling tests. What I will do is just click play game here and then you can have a quick look at the game screen what it looks like for pupils. I don't have any work set for me because I'm just logged in as a teacher here this is what it will look like and here will be any specific spelling lists so instead of seeing all the different stages they will have I don't know prefix unspelling list or whatever it is that you have set them and you have got lots of different spelling games that they can then use we've got quite a few new ones actually such as the hungry horse one I quite like this one copier Copier, sun, as the, in the sun shines in the sky. You've got a few different, you might have been able to notice that I could select the different uh, level that I could do. So extreme is a whole keyboard. Easy, you get shown the word and then the correct tiles used to make the word. Medium, you don't get shown the word, but like I've just had then, you get the exact correct tiles to make it. Hard, you get the exact correct tiles to make it, plus a few more. So extremes girls, would look as in like this. the girls' bathroom. The harder the level the children play on, the more points that they get, and then they get honey pots, which are the currency within the game, which they use to create their own avatar up there. Also, with spelling shed, you get access to our whole spag scheme, which also goes from year one to year six, and we have quizzes that go with each of our teacher. Uh, powerpoints that you would teach so if I click into one these would be the pupil quizzes that again you can assign to pupils to access on their logins to go with whatever you've taught that day so here we go we've got identifying and sorting nouns and you can get it read out so if they are in year one look at this phrase the red bike Jamal thinks that the word bike should be written with a capital B because it is a proper noun Ruth thinks the word bike does not need a capital B because it is a verb. Eve thinks the word bike does not need a capital B because it is a common noun. Who is correct? Select an answer below, Eve, Jamal, or... So you can go through like that and you can see some of them are multiple choice. Some you have to input specifically, some you have to order, so they're all... All a bit different from each other they're not all the same if you haven't got it already i'd recommend getting a free trial for spelling shed it runs out automatically after 30 days so you don't have to worry about cancelling it if you can get a free trial for just your class or the whole school or just yourself it's completely up to you um but if you've got any more further questions email support at edshed.com and our support team will be happy to help with any other questions but I'll just quickly check our Q&A, see if there's any more on there. But I hope that was useful and I will leave you to enjoy your evening. Thanks for listening.